Did you know that Nerd and Tie is putting on a convention and that you can help sponsor it? That's right, we're going to be running the Nerd and Tie Expo from September 23rd through 25th in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And right now, we need your help. Just go to http colon slash slash igg dot me forward slash at forward slash n-e-x-p-o and help us make the best con we can. On this episode of Nerd and Tie, there's going to be a new Doc Brown Back to the Future short. There's a new Doctor Who spinoff class in the works. Prometheus 2 is now Alien Paradise Lost. There's a possible Men in Black reboot on the way. We let Nick talk about Gundam. And the video game voice actors might be striking. Oh my god! Oh dear, and welcome to Nerd and Ty. Huzzah! Yeah, we're here. The the only podcast on the internet with a dress code. I am one of your co-hosts, Tradorn. Joining me as always are the Splendiferous Firsters. Hey, Packers won today, so I'm feeling pretty good about everything. Decked out in his finest of sports ball apparel. Right? Hey, and, we're 4-0. Oh, I'll take that way. I'll take that. And also joining me. The oblivious yet sensuous Nick Izumi. Wait, what? <laughs> oh yeah, that's what Daddy likes. Okay. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, so I have a special request that you never say that phrase ever again, <laughs> Trey. <laughs> <laughs> I think I speak for all of the nerd and tie listeners all over the world when I say, please don't ever say that phrase ever again. Okay, I will never say Nick Izumi again. That's oh, I understand. Well, make things no, really dang it! <laughs> oh. oh well. So how how's uh, how's the week going for you guys? It good. is good, yeah, man. I to happen. Second week of uh, Escanaba and the Moonlight rehearsals went well. The Packers won today. I mean, I don't think you can get much better than what things have been doing now. How, how have you yeah. been? How have you been doing, Nick? Did you enjoy Attack on Titan? Yeah, it's it's been a mixed week because yeah, I, <laughs> I got to upload my my best video ever to my channel, um, my Dragon Ball Evolution review, but that was tempered by getting to see the live action Attack on Titan movie. Guys, it's bad. <laughs> Anyone who tells you otherwise is either lying to you, or they are such a huge fan of the manga and or anime that they can't see what a terrible movie they sat through. That's that's my only explanation. Because, good God. Um, I've, I've waited for this day. I have. <laughs> <laughs> God, the theater's getting their subtitles stuck on that. Like, that was almost a story on this episode, but I was just like, what are we going to say besides, ha ha. This and, is... And I, the foibles I mean, it, of digital it subtitling. It, it happened at the Madison screening. I know three people who were at the screening with the screwed up subtitles, so that was tragic. Did they have um, one in Janesville? No. Um, oh, where did you go to, to see it? Um, I got a hold of a screener, actually. But, oh, um, okay. Yeah. Um, through, so I was able to take a look at it. Um Funimation subtitles were, I mean, like, there are, people are going to take issues with certain things in the subtitles, like, uh, Funimation is still calling the, uh, the, uh, equipment the, uh, omnidirectional gear instead of 3D gear, but that's 3D. what, but that's what Kodansha, like, literally told them they had to change it to, so, that wasn't actually their choice, um, all of the problems with the movie are just, really bizarre writing choices it's like it's not just bad adaptation it's changing things for no good reason that don't actually help the story at all um and i know some people are worried because the director is shinji higuchi who is co-directing the new godzilla movie with hideaki Anno. um but shinji higuchi is normally a good director he really is. It, it's just, this is really bad. Uh, on the downside, he ha hasn't been taking criticism very well, so, mm, yeah. 
I don't know, you guys. It, it, Attack on Titan's a terrible movie. Which is too bad because it's yeah. a really good anime series and a really good manga. So well, yeah, yeah, how no. Can like, you, like, how how can you screw up the source material that badly? Like that. Well, the, well, life finds a way. I was about to say, um, <laughs> for, for the full uh, rundown, uh, you can check out uh, in another act of shameless self promotion. I wrote a full review on the website on nerdandtie dot com. Um, that's not really shameless when you're on the show for that website. That, that's no, that's true. Yeah, you can that's check cross out promotion. My... <laughs> well, you can Synergy. check out my my full written review at nerdandtie dot com. But you know, long story short, a lot of weird changes. Um, they decided to set the story in Japan rather than. Well, that was a necessity. That was a necessity, yes. And I'm not saying, and that in and of itself was not a bad decision. What was a questionable decision was keeping all of the German names on everybody. Yeah, that that I thought they would have. I thought they cha- were going to change some of them. Um, no, the main character's name is still Aaron Yeager, um, Sasha Braus. Um, uh, Armin Arlet or Arlert, excuse me. Yeah, all still have their German names. Um, oh. some of the characters were replaced by Japanese characters, like uh, Levi was replaced by a character named Shikishima, but no, everyone still had German names. <laughs> so I, it left me wondering if it was set at some like if the apocalypse took place and all that survived was a German Oktoberfest. Um, it, <laughs> or excuse me, a Japanese Oktoberfest. Yeah, it was very, <laughs> it was very strange. Um, well, <laughs> yeah. Moving on to our first story. Let's, let's <laughs> not dwell on this. It's hurting. <laughs> oh dear. Well, moving on to our first story. Let us speak of happier things. Yeah, absolutely. Because now, right now. I don't know if any of you noticed the calendar, but it is October of 2015. It sure is, Trey. Which, which means in in a few short weeks, we will officially be living in the future. As October 21st, 2015 is the actual day that Marty travels to in Back to the Future 2. But Trey, I thought... That, As opposed I mean, to all the stupid day. image memes that have been popping up for the last, like, five years. I am so <laughs> happy. We will finally, like... Oh, my... Okay, anyways. Obviously, Universal is taking the opportunity to uh, release Back to the Future on Blu-ray for the first time. And uh, with that Blu-ray release, we get to see a new in continuity canonical short film featuring Christopher Lloyd. Oh Yay. yeah, he's the best named <laughs> Christopher out there. That's oh dear lord. Actually ex- that's fantastic. Yeah. So, entitled Doc uh, Brown Saves the World, it has a very brief there's a very brief teaser out for it and I, there's there's not much to say about it besides just doc brown in a r- white room stumbling out of the delorean that's i'll take it so anytime yeah. christopher lloyd does anything i love it doc brown in it this year if yeah. you don't count if you don't count rick and morty <laughs> well well i'm still count, but well you can't count that but you can count the uh video game lego dimensions he's also playing uh, that's doc right. that's true brown in that that's true. So, so that's so, freaking awesome. So so we literally know nothing about this short film besides the fact that it's going to star Christopher Lloyd. It'll be included on the Back to the Future trilogy uh, Blu-ray set. And uh, it will be in canon. And one can assume that it will be set in the present day, also known as the future. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we're in the future for more like because like I'm the resident sports expert here at Nerd and Tie. But uh, the Cubs are in the playoffs this year. <laughs> the Cubs actually have a chance to win the World Series in October of 2015. Yeah, but 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 are the Marlins still in it? No, the Marlins have been out since right, probably but it's last supposed to be July. the supposed to be the the you know Cubs Miami game. That would be possible if Miami was still in the AL, but oh yeah, yeah, they're not. Well, then it's impossible. The whole thing's but, impossible. 
But the Cubs could very well win the World Series this year. They've got one of the best pitchers to ever pitch. I refuse to accept that. And as a person born and bred in a White Sox home, I refuse to accept that as a possibility and deny it. (laughs) You're a South Side guy, huh? As someone completely oblivious to sports, I say harumph. It's well, it, it would I'm a White Sox fan. My father's a White Sox fan. My grandfather was a White Sox fan. It's a blood thing. Your great grandfather played for the White Sox. No, he lived in Albuquerque. Oh, oh. <laughs> so he played for the Albuquerque Isotopes. <laughs> is is that real? I wouldn't know. <laughs> That's a real team. They're they're the Triple A team for. Uh, Shoot, I don't know who they're the farm team for, but they're a real team. Wow. I believe uh, you. I, I have no choice but to believe you. Yeah. So, anyways, back to the So future. look out for the Cubs to win the World Series this year, guys. <laughs> we may not have flying cars, but we do have the ability to make video phone calls. But Flea will never be your boss. And uh, we, we have hoverboards, too, kind of now. Wow. They're working it's, on it. I mean, it's just magnetic fields. It's, it it's not, it doesn't count. Yeah, it does. The flying car will come before the hoverboard, and the flying car ain't coming. I bet you, I bet you the hoverboard will be out in two years, Trey. Not a, not one that fe- functions like the one in the film. Oh, okay. That's fair. I mean, yes. Okay. So it would be neat. But okay. First off, <laughs> well, I don't know why everyone's excited about hoverboards, only because. That if they were in theory, theory actually working, like if if this was a thing that existed, you would need the same set of skills to fl- to ride one as you would to skateboard, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you'd think. Do, I mean, in theory, pretty much. Do Less any of you actually yeah. know how to skateboard? Yes, I do not. I I don't. I don't care to. Do, do you actually know how to skateboard really first? Yes. You understand that this means that we're going to make you skateboard, right? I can do it. I mean, I, I, from (laughs) when in my middle, when I was a middle schooler from like seventh grade to probably ninth grade, like halfway through ninth grade, I had a skateboard and I rode it quite regularly. And then I, then I realized how kind of like lame it made me. So I'm not going (laughs) to, I'm not going to do it anymore. I mean, like going to college, I do one guy who rode a skateboard. Well, longboards are different. Well, I've... Wait, no, that was before your time. Or that was after your time. I'm longboards talking... in college are a huge thing right now. Like, everybody and their grandma has a longboard. Yeah, I, I finished DWC. I, I dropped out of college and then went back to college. And when last time I was in college was 2007, which is when I finished my bachelor's. So, no, it's, I mean, I'm, no, no, no one's going to freaking skateboard. So no one's going to hoverboard, so there's no market, so no one's going to spend millions of dollars developing something that would work as well as what's on the... So what you'll get are people like Lexus developing their hoverboard that is something that can only be used really in special situations, but it looks good in an ad. So it's going to hit the nostalgia because, again, the people who are big fans of Back to the Future 2 when it was new are people my age, 35, where the people Lexus wants to buy Lexuses. Although, ha, 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 it's we're a generation of broke 35-year-olds. Suck it. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, anyway, <laughs> Doc Brown short. It's going to be great. I, I'm, I'm glad, you know, the first two were amazing. I like the first two Back to the Future movies. I love the I third the one. First, I, I, I thought like the, the third one was a little I bit. I don't I, like the second one at all. I, I like the third movie way more than I like the second one. I, I think like the I think the third movie, movie is less problematic with its time travel than than the I other one. I think the one, third one the is less one. problematic. Period. But <laughs> so also, anyways, it didn't suck of the writers literally had any idea with Marty's girlfriend, so they just bring her back. Out. Cylon Nick has told us that Marty's girlfriend wasn't coming back. Well, well we, no, we great. Why is my audio being weird? Still being weird? No, you're better now. So uh, with that, Nick, let's, what, let's move on to the next story. Move us on, Nick. Moving forward. All right. So we have an 
uh, without Doctor Who spinoff shows for a very long time. Uh, during the Navy's era, we had both the Sarah Jane adventures, which of course tragically ended when we lost Sladen. We are getting like, we are dr- losing like one out of every five words you're saying, Nick. Gosh, dang it. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> uh, okay. keeping that in mind, what Nick just said was we haven't had a new Doctor <sighs> Who spinoff right. for a while. It's been a bit. Uh, you know. But- we, we lost Sarah Jane. We, we lost Torchwood had that awful American season. Um, I think, I think parts of Miracle Day were okay. Yeah. Mir- like, I mean, it is. I mean, it it, was, it's, uh, it's the weakest season uh, out of the, part, the four but, seasons. Mm-hmm. Part of it were okay, but the overall, I mean, Torch, was, Torch yeah. had really peaked in season two. Yes. And, it, and then it, it never did as well as the second season. And then, and then came the horrible, depressing, Children of Earth. Oh my God! Oh, Children of Earth is one of those things that I'm I'm glad I said, but I did not enjoy it at all. Yeah, I I watched that probably a what what year did that come out? Uh, actually, the DVD is like right here. Um, don't ask me why I have that out. Uh, two thousand nine. Yeah, I watched that two years after because it was on Netflix two years after it came out. And I remember holding my daughter and like not letting her go watching this, watching all of <laughs> Children of Earth. I'm so sorry. I'm so- and I was just like, no. And, you know, I was going to that's awful. And, and Miracle Day, I think the Miracle Day's problem was that they said, hey, we're on stars now. We can show people fucking. And so they decided to spend way too much time showing it. Probably. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, anyway, but, why are we talking about Doctor Who spinoffs, Nick? Well, it turns out that the uh, BBC finally go ahead with a young adult Doctor Who off that they're calling Class. And, and if for if written, people who didn't hear what Nick just said, the BBC is coming sorry. out with a new young adult Doctor Who spinoff called Class. Yeah. Hot diggity. It's it's written by Patrick Ness. Um uh who uh has mainly done young adult novels. Does not uh does not have much of a career with TV. This is his first TV job. Yeah. And um yeah. Uh, they're kind of pitching this as kind of like Hunger Games esque, which I don't know what to make of that. Well, I, didn't, I don't. I don't really think it was necessarily Hunger Games esque, but just that it's there. It's going to be the Doctor Who spinoff that in America would be suitable to air on the CW. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that's that's oh, really boy. what they're going for. So it's, it's smarter than most of their show. Yeah, oh. it's. So it's it's going to be a uh, a teen focused uh, Doctor Who series, just like Sarah Jane Adventures was a kid focused series set in the universe. This is going to be a teen focused one around a uh, set in current day London, and one assumes around a class of students, just based It'd be off the really title. Weird if it wasn't. <laughs> no, you see, they're talking about someone having class. <laughs> Yes. We're gonna get into that when I talk about Gundam later. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's it, this is Moffat's first spinoff. All the other spinoffs were created by Russell T. Davies, so it's uh, um, it's it's interesting that he's. I mean, like, because Davies continued running Sarah Jane Adventures even after he handed off Doctor Who. Um, so it's it's gonna be interesting. Uh, to see how this goes. Uh, personally, uh, you know, I don't know this 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 writer's work that much. I'm always skeptical about Moffat. Although I will say that, I mean, three episodes into the current season, and I will say that this is so far the of regular Doctor Who. This is the best season of Doctor Who under Moffat's tenure. I haven't watched any of the new season yet, so I don't know. Well, um, he, he's folk- audio improvements. Yeah. Um, He's focusing on the the current season of Doctor Who is all focusing on um, multi part stories and not a season long arc. Ooh. 
where it's he's he's they're doing stories um because you know if you remember if you watch the original doctor who uh you know it's all like six part stories and four part stories and they're all but they're all like half hour episodes so you know right they were serials yeah but so so what he's doing though so a two parter is about the length of a four episode serial from the old show so this season is supposed to be entirely composed of two parters and three parters i'm good with that i'm and, really good with that yeah the first two parter i think worked out really well and uh we're halfway through the you know the the next story um, with this week's episode that aired yesterday. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's been really good. You know, tell me about, I was uh, sitting on a doctor who fan panel, um, at Daisho con, like the, the day before the 50th anniversary aired. And the guy who was paneling with me, giant size, Brandon from Otaku tonight. One of the things that he said he would like to see in the future was for them to return to serials. Yeah. And then we wrote that off as something that was never going to happen. So <laughs> he must be tickled right now. Yeah. That's... Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, as no. long as they let the writer kind of do his thing, like with as little interference as from Stephen Moffat as possible, I think I'd like to give this show a shot. Well, we have no idea whether, like, I've never read this writer's books, so we've, it, who knows? We'll find out. Moffat's still executive producing, and we're assuming he's going to be show running it. Um, but I'm assuming, like when Russell T. Davies was still running Doctor Who, um, he'll be handing off a lot of the responsibilities to uh, his co-producers. Hopefully, yes. Um, I I just I'll probably give it a look. I mean, you know, obviously I'm not the target demographic for this thing, so uh, you know. Well, well our, we're all still going to watch it, right? I mean, that's... Yes. Well, I'll give it a shot anyway. I, I watched the Sarah Jane Adventures. Yes, I'm going to watch it. <laughs> I Sarah Jane through. Adventures was a fantastic TV show, though. It really was. Well, you know, it's the late Elizabeth Sladen. It, it, it was, she was Elizabeth Sladen, man. Yeah, exactly. It was yeah. Elizabeth Sladen carrying a TV show. It, it, what could go wrong? I mean, you know, I always had a thing for Elizabeth Slayton. Anyways. <laughs> Acceptable. Speaking of spinoffs. What? <laughs> a few years ago, and I wish I could tell the exact date, because uh, because quite honestly, I remember going to the midnight showing of it and walking out of the midnight showing going, what on earth did I just watch? Uh, <laughs> Prometheus. Prometheus came out a few years ago, and... While it was pitched kind of as a, as a prequel to the Alien series, it sort of stood out on its own. Like, for instance, well, having a completely well, different tried, story. They actually tried to pretend not... it wasn't an Alien prequel. Well, they tried. That was meant to be a twist. Uh, until the, you know, Xenomorph shows up at the end. But anyway. Right. But the whole point is on all the marketing, they, like, hid that it was in the Alien universe. Well, uh, we are getting, we have known for a while that Ridley Scott wanted a second Prometheus movie to happen, and, uh, well, we're getting it. But it's not going to be called Prometheus. Yeah, for a while it's been referred to as Prometheus 2, but not anymore. No, instead they're calling it Alien Paradise Lost. Because the religious uh, overtones of the first movie were lost on, like, two people. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, you know, yes. if you're gonna rip anyone off, I'd say Milton isn't like on the top of my list, really. Yes, uh, that means that within the next few years, we've got a movie that is going to be set directly, exactly in the Alien universe, almost a direct sequel to Alien Four with uh, that's Neil Blomkamp. Neil Blomkamp's like, Alien Five, which five. is yeah, it's 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 gonna be he's he's con like he's he's gonna try to continue off of like the aliens part of the story but the but three and four will still be canon but uh we are getting uh we are getting alien paradise lost which is going to be a sequel to prometheus 2 or prometheus rather um and uh <laughs> being written well initially it was penned by jake paglin uh who who was uh um, wrote Transcendence and uh, has been rewritten since by Michael Green, who wrote the Green Lantern movie. Is he one of the? <laughs> is he related to to the other Greens? 
Uh, <laughs> Vlog Brothers? That would be strange. But, uh, no, uh, we're, we're, of course, a lot of things have been happening. There's news about the new Prometheus movie pretty much every day. Of course, the last big news that came out, we covered here at Nerd and Tie, uh, there's not going to be any xenomorphs in Alien, or in Prome- or in Alien Paradise Lost. There's going to be no aliens. Yeah, so the, there's going to be no, okay, so what I love about this is that, so we've got Paradise Lost, <laughs> Alien Paradise Lost, and Alien 5 coming, but they're going to be on different ends of the story, right? One's a prequel, one's a sequel. To the pre-existing films. Now, you and I, and you know, like the three of us, we we can like parse that continuity. But the casual alien, like the casual person, who goes, "Oh, I saw Alien, whatever. I'll go see the new one." And then, like, like goes and sees like Paradise Lost, or then sees Alien Five, and there's zero con- Like, it's just going to be confusing as all hell. I mean, it's going to be like all the people are going to be really confused in a few years when DC has Ezra Miller come in as the Flash, and they're going to be like, "Well, that's not the Flash." <laughs> well, see, I just my favorite whole thing about this whole bit is is reading the scripting process for this, where Ridley Scott has said <laughs> all the like insane things that were going to happen in the movie. My favorite being that they were going to reveal that uh, the historical figure Jesus Christ was actually going to be one of the engineers that was touched on in the first movie. Wait, that was, oh my like, God. That, was well, that was what was going to happen in Paradise Lost was that it was going to reveal that Jesus uh, was an engineer. Well, okay, so and and let's let's <laughs> like this is <laughs> this is so insane. Hey, and don't forget the Predators had an alien train had a xenomorph based training ground in Antarctica because you can't forget the Alien versus Predator movies. I love the Alien vs. Predator movies. Shut up. They're great. No, I'm saying that, like, this is going to be the most confusing thing in the world for consumers. I love this so much. And 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 and, and Ridley Scott wants to make two more prequels, which I, he was referring to as Prometheus 3 and 4 before. So he wants to, like, make two more prequels. And they're going to have to use the alien title because they're not going to be able to call it Prometheus 3. They can't so not anymore. Have, they could they have called it, it anymore. If, yeah, because they'll have started going to alien. So it's going to be alien, you know, Don, alien inferno. You know, it's going to be <laughs> something, something ridiculous. But I uh, know Prometheus. Alien uh, the screw tape letters is the one I'm really looking forward to. <laughs> but, alien course, the divine comedy. You know, it's. Uh, <laughs> uh, of course, um, God, where's, where's my other information about it? We're still getting the same, same actors in it. Uh, we're, we're still going to get, um, Michael Fassbender. Whether I would say the return of Robo Fassbender. Whenever, whether, uh, whether we get his body is yet to be seen or not. I personally am hoping for like the body to be doing something like piloting the ship while, well, uh, <laughs> Numi Rapas uh, is carrying around Michael Fassbender's head, and they're like, come on, David's body, and it's like running into a wall because it can't see, and she looks at Michael Fassbender, and he says something like, well, you try to control your body when it's not attached to you. Like, uh, that's what I'm hoping for. That's I'm hoping for the headless Spiro Agnew of Michael Fassbender's body. <laughs> Adventure time, come on, grab your head. We'll go to Barry Aspen Lands oh, sweet with dude. Shaw the Doctor oh, and, go. and David the Robot. The fun will never end. It's adventure time. What's wrong with you? Lots of things are wrong with him. <laughs> I'm so excited for how this like this absolute train wreck is gonna go. I can't wait. Uh, <laughs> And I'm normally a pretty positive person on this show, but my God, this is, oh. Dear Lord. Well, it's 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 going to be a disaster, which is why I love the fact that he's got plans for, like, the third and fourth prequel, only because they won't happen. They're not going to happen. It's going to fall apart. Like, this, this franchise has to fall apart. They've made too big a plan. Because I don't think the Alien brand is big enough to support this level of insanity. It isn't. I don't think it's, there's a, a, 
I don't think there's a demand. Yeah, a demand. I don't think there's a demand for it. No, it's they not like they it out too much. Like I don't think people care anymore. Really, I think I think I think Alien Paradise Lost would, would have been more successful as Prometheus Two. I agree, but you know, I'm not Ridley Scott. Thank God for that. Right, Pr- Alien. He's got a lot of money. I could Paradise Lost. Hey, you know. The more distracted he shooting. is making weird alien prequels, though, the the m- more likely it is he won't make a Blade Runner sequel, and the happier I'll be. Uh, so. They're making the Blade Runner sequel. I know they are, but I want things to stop. Harrison it from Ford happening. is in it. I'm <laughs> as is Ryan Gosling, and Deckard is a replicant. Yes, I know because there is no justice in this universe. But but that's the best version of the story where Deckard is a replicant. I have mixed feelings because yes, it's the best cut of the movie, but it's also it. It means that there are no human leads at all, except for Edward James Olmos. And I guess I mean it. Yeah, now we solidly have Edward James Olmos' entire footprint in science fiction movies is calling robots skin jobs, but still. <laughs> <sighs> Alien and, and teaching and teaching kids math, right? I mean, but that's not a science fiction movie. Um, Alien. Me? Am I the only person who saw Stand by Me? Anyways, yeah, you are. Alien, Paradise Lost. It's a culturally important film. Starts <laughs> filming early 2016. You know, you know what else is a culturally important Trey? film? Men in Black. I love okay, that. it's not, but that was the best transition I could come up with there. <laughs> the Men in Black series, of course, you know, starring you know Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones as much as possible. Um, uh, Sony wants to keep the thing going. Let's the Sony, right? Well, yeah, I mean, Sony. If, <laughs> if there's if there's one thing we've learned from living in the 2010s, it's that people want to live in the 90s. Right. Well, <laughs> and to be fair, Men in Black 3, which just came out a few years ago, was actually very successful and a pretty good movie. Oh, it wasn't wasn't bad at all. It was no, enjoyable. It, I didn't what I expected see it for Men in Black. It's what I expected because I hated Men the Black second movie. one. So well, the second one was the Temple of Doom of the Men in Black movies. So... <laughs> I, I, I guess it's right. just like the first one is so dark and, and like it, it's so big concept sci-fi. And then the second one was just kind of eh. Well, that and the, the first one had, you know, Vincent D'Onofrio as the bad guy as opposed to like mm-hmm. Laura Flynn Boyle. And let me tell you, I love Twin Peaks as much as the next guy. But no, <laughs> she was just terrible. Well, the problem was that script was awful. Yeah, yeah, um, it was really bad. But the but my man Black Three was actually good, and so needless to say, Sony's wanting to get more mileage out of the property. Well, the problem is, is that even though they want to do a like, and they want to do like a Men in Black Twenty One Jump Street crossover, like this is how <laughs> much they want to milk the franchise. My God, that that's are any of you aliens around here doing drugs? <laughs> Um, but, but although, and while it would be glorious to see men in black become part of the continuity of the 1980s, 21 jump street TV series, because the movies are in continuity with that TV series. Oh, that's right. They are, aren't they? They are. So that would be amazing. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. Because Sony oh. wants to, um, well, the, oh. the word reboots using being used about the franchise, but Sony wants to make a new uh, set of Men in Black movies um, about a, a new set of Men in Black agents. Well, um, okay. So it's, it, it hasn't been, t- like, it's, people have been talking about it like a reboot, but all we know is that it would be a new set of uh, Men in Black movies not about Will Smith's character. So with with new characters, um, so it, it, uh, they could do a hard reboot, but I think it's more likely they'll do a soft reboot of the franchise, just because it's the, the organization's supposed to be huge, right? So right, just find well, you know, agents C and D instead. You know, honestly, initially when I've heard about it, I was kind of against it, but now the more I think about it, I think one of the big mistakes they made with Men in Black with with franchising it 
was that the first movie was so big in its concepts, and then the sequel, we just go back to the same two guys. Maybe looking at it with different agents will be an, an opportunity to expand that universe. Yeah, so it's... I I really open to that idea. Yeah. I don't know if they'd do it, but... Yeah, it's, you know, I think it would be awesome. Will Smith, in the last couple of years, has been reluctant to come back to his old properties. I mean, yes, he did Men in Black 3, but he's talking about not being willing to do more Men in Black movies. He's, like, the only star of Independence Day not coming back for Independence Day 2. Mm. Um, it, like, I mean, like, literally, like, Vivica A. Fox is there. Jeff Goldblum's there. No Will Smith. No Will Smith. I think Bill Pullman might not be back. Also, but um, I think that's just because there's, I, I believe his absence is character driven while uh, Will Smith's is Will Smith not being willing to come back for the movie driven. <clears throat> but yeah, so mm-hmm. it's, I, I think it would be a good thing. I'm, I would be excited about a new Men in Black movie. You know, it's, I mean, yes, it's a comic adaptation, so it would mean yet another film in the theaters that's both a sequel and a comic movie. I'm open to it so long as they get a good writer, you know, if there's a good script. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Like, I don't want another half-assed, um, reboot hard or soft, but if they had like a really good writer, who's actually willing to explore this universe more, that would be great. That would be a miracle. Well, I love the design aesthetics of the series. Um, like the the very like uh, the the retro futurism in a lot of the stuff where mm-hmm. it's very sixties um, and a, a sci fi vision of the future, right? Like golden age sci fi vision of the future. Hence, hence retro futurism. Yeah, that is the official term for that. Is it Trey? Yes. Mm. I just wiki did. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you can you can say anything on Wikipedia. It's. Tr- True, I, I just added that. It says science. you can, can say anything on Wikipedia, I and it's true. It's on the article about that Wikipedia. Someone like Donald Trump is a presidential candidate. Uh, you can say for... anything you want on Wikipedia. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Had to get it in there. Uh, all right. I think that's all we have to say about that topic. So I think it's time that we let Nick talk about Gundam. Yeah, I like when Nick talks about things. Raise your flag. Okay. Sorry. I am... This has been a good week for Gundam. This week, in general, has been a good week for Gundam. Um, we uh, we took back the uh, New York Times graphic novels bestseller list again with Gundam The Origin, Volume 11. But bigger, much bigger, um, Sunrise, who, as I've mentioned on the show before, adapt about as well as dinosaurs do to comets, have decided to move into the 21st century. That's right. They finally agreed to simulcast their c- current big TV Gundam series and without doing anything stupid like they have so many times before. Um, Gundam Age, a series they made a big deal about how it was going to be streamed in several countries. They put up an English subtitled version on YouTube and then blocked it in the U.S. and Canada and England. They, they seriously did that? They seriously oh. did that. That's um, nuts. Just a couple months ago, uh, they did the same thing, except uh, they only they only did it after a while. They did uh, uh, Tomino series, the uh, the one that we were making so much fun of, uh, uh, Gundam Reconquista of G. <laughs> G. Um, <laughs> yes, that was... Discovery all, textbook banana pants or whatever <laughs> Sass Man. Sass Man's discovery textbook or something like that yeah 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 uh reconquista was on youtube and they had that streaming in the u.s for nine episodes and then they took it down again <laughs> well um Dysky.net worked out some sort of a deal with uh sunrise i don't know what but they got both uh reconquista of g and uh, the brand new series, which just started airing in Japan literally this morning, um, uh, Iron-Blooded Orphans, simultaneously streaming. 
Uh, it's available on Dicey.net's website, or if you have Hulu Plus, it's right there. Wait, all of yeah. I'll let you finish your sentence. All of Reconquista is on, on Hulu Plus, or is on I think on regular Hulu for that matter. And uh, the brand new episode of Iron Blooded Orphans is uh, avail is right now. It, it it is streaming. I watched it twice. It's available. It is, yeah, make fun of my pronunciation all you want. <sighs> I don't know I have what you're trouble. talking about. But I just want to point out this series is named Iron-Blooded Orphans. Uh-huh. Is it like, you know, a bunch of Gundam pilots singing It's a Hard Knock Life? and Actually, this is, uh, as of the first episode... This is the first Gundam show that's actually addressing the whole child soldier thing, as in that it might be a completely morally bankrupt thing to throw children into robots and make them fight. Well, no shit! (laughs) I mean, anime has been doing that since basically there's been anime, but I love that this one is actually addressing that. Um... It's set the at least the first episode is set on Mars. Um, there's a big Martian independence movement because apparently Mars is being treated like a colony of Earth, and uh, there is so it's every uh, we it's also every we, story about Mars. Pretty much, yeah. Um, so that's nothing new. Sci-fi but, case uh, cliche number three: Mars is oppressed Earth colony. Mars wants independence. Martian we, independence. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. Am I what talking about cut? Artemage? Am I talking about um, the yeah. desk? Are we talking about I... Zone of the Enders? No. We're Am talking I talking about, about FTL Newsfeed on Sci Fi Channel in 1993, the in between commercial break science fiction news program? I'm well, not kidding. That was like a major storyline on that show. Dear show. God. It was it was an awesome show because it just presented as like news <laughs> updates from the future with like just like getting the news feed and getting interviews from like the Earth Alliance, North American, the North American uh, Federation, which was like a combination of the U.S. and Canada, and had like a maple leaf U.S. flag. It was awesome. That's um, ridiculous. It was oppressing that. the Mars colonies. No, but but really, this show, this Iron Blooded Orphans, is. Uh, I I now I know that I'm the show's resident Gundam fan, but it really is an amazing. It was an amazingly strong first episode, despite the use of that cliche. Um, it was super brutal, though. Like normally, the TV Gundam shows are the ones that are more kid friendly, whereas the OVAs are the ones that get dark and brutal. This one we had teenagers getting taken out by snipers, and that was incredibly unpleasant. Um. Uh, the main character, it's implied he killed someone when he was a very small child and he was smiling about it. Uh, yeah. So this is Gundam Tech finally addressing the whole being a child soldier thing might not be such a good idea. Well, wasn't that the whole point of Evangelion? Well, yeah, but Evangelion is at the end. Evangelion, really, if you analyze the story, is a 90s, is kind of a 90s retelling of 70s Gundam. Well, yeah, it was, I mean, it was a deconstruction of the of the genre. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, um, but yes, it's good that Gundam's but, finally tackling something that everyone else was talking about in Gundam <laughs> 20 years ago. More or less. I mean, it's, I, I mean, I get it, yeah. But it's it's nice to see the series so self aware. It's looking to be very different. Um, there's the character designs are very unique. Um, actually, lots of people with varying, really with a lot of dark skin tones, which is, you know, again, it's, it's nice to see a bit more representation and doing something different in anime. And thank God, the robots, the robots don't look like every other Gundam robot. Uh, I believe it's a new mech designer. So, yeah, if you get the chance, do take a look at Iron Blooded Orphans. If you need a, some dark sci fi anime, it might be up your alley. But they're not red, white, and blue with long legs and the little skirt. And, uh, well, that part, they have the coloration is something that they have. And... 
the the coloring is something that they have trouble they're going to have some trouble kicking but uh this gundam has much more a lot more rounded edges um actually the gundam in this show is a relic from a war from a long time ago the main characters that the pmc group that the main character is with have been kind of restoring it as a hobby. So it looks like a fracked up old war machine. Is this universal it, century or is this a new continuity? It's, it, it's another new continuity. Okay. Um, so I don't know how many timelines we're at right now. <laughs> I'll throw one more on the Barbie, I guess. Um, so is, and, and this is a, a new continuity. And this is the first series set in that continuity. Yep. Brand new. Brand new continuity, brand new uh, series. Uh, so no so, previous yeah. Gundam knowledge is necessary. Right. So, yeah, so, so new viewers can jump right in. And mm-hmm. it's just starting. And it's get available it, to view for American fans legally. Get in at the ground floor, you guys. Like I said, it's streaming on several pl- platforms. If you don't have Hulu Plus, try out, um, try out Daisuke.net. I know has it streaming. Um, yeah, streaming legally very very worth your time solid stuff yeah can't wait to see where it goes oh boy that's all i've got right now oh sorry where what i what god fur dang it i was paying attention i was engaging something about robots and i i engaged nick has such a soothing calm voice though it just kind of Loses your crap over Pacific Rim, but can't respect the franchise that inspired it. Ultraman? <laughs> okay, yeah. Someday I... Ultraman. 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 We're Ultraman. gonna have a show where I'll talk about Ultraman. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that, I, mean, I love no. Ultraman. You know, Not as much as Hideaki Anno loves Ultraman. For, for why don't you take us on to a little okay. more serious a topic? Yeah. Um, downer of a topic. Bit of a downer of a topic, of course. Um... Yeah. In uh, in, in the world uh, we live in, um, I mean, I mean, everybody, everybody's should get paid for their for their work that they do, and uh, and and we have a lot of different ways to to negotiate for for the pay that people get that they do, and uh, one of the ways that that people do that is through unions, and right now one of the one of the unions that we're going to be like that's in focus right now is the voice actor, the video game voice actor union. Well, it's it's SAG AFTRA. Uh, SAG AFTRA. Which it's, is it's is a, yeah. an offshoot of the Screen Actors Guild, um, yes. which which it is the Screen Actors Guild. SAG AFTRA is the Screen Actors SAG part of this. It's, it's particularly though it's the people who working in the video game I was industry. About, I was about to say it's the people that do voiceovers and work with and specifically the video game industry. Trey, thank you. Right. Well, but I was I was saying it's specifically the union is yes. just SAG AFTRA regular SAG AFTRA. Um, thank you, Trey. Uh, well, uh, as of tomorrow, right now, today is, of course, Sunday, October the 4th. Tomorrow is Sunday, the October the 5th, is the deadline for the vote for, or tomorrow's Monday, October the 5th, excuse me. Um, <laughs> I was going to let it slide. Sunday every day. Uh, is the deadline for, for members of sag after to vote to go on strike uh, for for better occupational situations uh within the voice acting uh realm of video games um they have cited a couple of different things like uh uh they want to get stunt pay for vocally stressful recording sessions they would like to have a stunt coordinator on set to uh they want to be able to prepare actors uh for motion capture uh situations as they necessary or as, as they would if they would like to be able to prepare, they would like to have a stunt coordinator there to prepare for that. And, uh, and a little bit more transparency on game projects. Now, as far as pay goes, uh, right now, video game voice actors do not receive royalties if a game makes profit. That is also something that they would really like to have happen uh, within a potential new contract that they would like to receive. But um, as of right now, it looks like, unless demands are met, they have met with uh, with Activision and EA and all these other, uh, and, and some of the other bigger uh production companies they've been meeting but it doesn't look like it's going to work so um entirely possible that as of tomorrow uh video game voice actors will be going on strike yeah the, yeah so so what's happened here is that um the there's a long list of demands from the the union including i mean there's the the mm-hmm. back end stuff but there's also safety recommendations um what what happened is is that the video game companies have been refusing to negotiate on anything 
So it's if you think if you're saying um, some of the people if, if they're saying well they you know they shouldn't get royalties when the programmers aren't and all this other stuff, that's an argument you can that that it's it's not to say that the union wasn't going to ever budge on that stuff, but that the the video game companies would not are will not make uh, any sort of move on anything. So that's why um, the the strike is an option. Again, this may not happen. It's they require seventy five vote seventy five percent of the voting population has to uh, vote for the spri- strike. Um, also, the video game industry wants some really weird stuff. Like they want to be able to find SAG AFTRA if agents who are registered with it don't send out clients to audition for work. Like they want to be able to find the union for that. They want to be able to find the people working for them if they feel like they don't they aren't up to energy or weird things. So if you ate like if you had a long day and you showed up to work, they want to be able to fine or fire you from a project just uh if if you look at them wrong effectively. It's so weird stuff. There's really weird mm. stuff that the video game industry is demanding. And so because the they they the because the the representatives of the video game industry have not been willing to move on any of these things, including vital safety stuff like a stunt coordinator on set for motion capture work. Because if you're asking a performer to perform like physical moves, you should have a stunt coordinator there. Period. Like if yeah. if you're <laughs> motion mo capping a fight scene, you need a stunt coordinator. What the heck are like? Why is that an issue? Where and the video game companies just want to save money, and we know that in the way they've driven their programmers and the way they're QA testers, and because the actors are one of the few people left in this country who have a powerful union, they have the ability. You know, they can actually stand up and say something. You know, if programmers would unionize in this country, maybe that would be something that they could fight back on too. But they don't. So, whatever. Um, now. Like what the the consequences if they choose to see so the problem is we record on Sunday and we won't know until the next couple of days and it's going to be two mm-hmm. weeks before our next show, um, and you guys are going to be at Anime Fusion that weekend too. Yeah, we so, sure are. Um, yep. Well, well we, we should, should talk about that, that after this story. Uh, <laughs> the uh, like we don't, but if if they choose to strike, if this goes, if the strike happens, this could stop all AAA titled video game development in the United States until it ends. Because um, while it's true, the rest of the game can be developed and worked on if there is no final performance to load into the rest of it, and that is an expected feature of most video games. You know, for vocal performance, you know, it's like if you're playing a Halo game you expect to hear Cortana. You know what I mean? It's if you're playing Master Chief, I don't know. I haven't played a Halo game since Halo 2. My point is though, like there's there's an expectation. And so th- this could literally put a, a, a grinding halt to any major video game releases for a while. So it's a big one. Of course Tomorrow, we may hear the announcement that Sag After has chosen not to strike up video game work. <laughs> yeah, we're going to, with all this sort of like everybody's kind of running towards it, and it's kind of looking that way. Watch something weird happening. <laughs> yeah, we record on Sunday nights, folks. Yeah. We do the best we can. But uh, in, in two weeks, you two are going to be at, at uh, Anime, Anime Fusion, Fusion in Minneapolis, Anime Minnesota Fusion. at the uh, Mall of America Ramada. And, and Nerd and Tie for the Nerd and Tie Expo is going to have a table there. We are. Uh, if you are going to, uh, if you are going to Anime Fusion, and you haven't pre-regged yet via our Indiegogo. First of all, why haven't you? Yeah, for the Nerd and Tie Expo, not for for Anime Nerd and Tie Fusion. Expo. Yeah. If you, you, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with We're you? We're not going to register you for you for Fusion. That's not second of all. You can register for Nerd and Tie Expo at Anime Fusion at our table that we're going to have. It's going to be great. We've got a good uh, group of people going to Anime Fusion to rep Nerd and Tie. Uh, we're all going to be doing a lot of fun things there that weekend uh, with, with our own personal side projects and other projects. So um, and come Nick- see us. Come say hi. Come say hi to Nick. Take a picture with Nick. It's true. Oh, Nick I'll in the face. Picturable. Take selfies Don't with Nick and me. Fur. Pretend you're me. Just get right between them. Stand on a stool. Convince girls that you hang out with the Vlog Brothers. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> so yeah, I won't be there, but these two will. Um, we haven't discussed whether we were going to try to do anything uh, live streamed from there or not, but uh, I the internet at that place is no good. Well, and to that place for the having been to that convention for the last three years, it's not great. Well, you know, if you can get a Skype call out, yeah, we'll see. We can, might be able to relay something through me. Do our best. We'll do what we can. Anyways, but, but uh, myself and Nick will be performing. Um, aside from doing nerd and tie stuff, Nick and myself will be performing. Uh, we'll do our improv stuff. We're gonna do do some game shows. I guess we're we're emceeing the cosplay contest. Woo! If you want to know what the cosplay contest at the Nerd and Tie Expo is going to be like, check out the cosplay <laughs> contest. Head check out this one. Fusion. Exactly. Basically. <laughs> it will be similar. <laughs> with, a, with one less musical number, because I don't think we're going to have time to write a musical number in time. Oh well, yeah, that, and I was gonna, I was more referring to the fact that I, if if it's exactly the same, it'd be really weird because we'd have to get all the same cosplayers to be in the contest, and I don't. I mean, it's not impossible. It, it's only you know, Anime Fusion's only like an hour away from where we're holding the Nerd and Tie Expo. That's true. That's true. Maybe it is doable. Hmm. Get all those cosplayers to pre-reg while you're there. <laughs> Just what you do is you know tell them it's a thirty dollar entrance fee. Mm. Have them fill out yeah. a form. What could go wrong? Lots of things, including getting arrested for fraud. But oh, it, it'd be worth it. Dang, I don't think that would be worth it. Or would it? I, I think we should move forward. All right. Well, it's Where have we got? Time. Where's the mailbag? Where is it? Give it to me. All right. Here it is. All right, so we have one letter in our mailbag for this fortnight. Hot ah, diggity. Old, uh, indeed, yeah, and it's from our old friend, KOR fan. Core fan. You can say core, core fan. fan. Our old pal, Core fan, and he's, his topic is Coolicon. Um, I heard the comments about Coolicon not having a program book. What is done is to hang a grid printout in the lobby or registration area so people can see the schedule and make notes from it. I've been to at least one con where uh, that was the case. It may and it may have been uh, uh, where that was the case. I may have been and I may have staffed another. Sometimes it's intentional and sometimes caused by failure by the print shop. Anyway, that uh, that used to be the standard paradigm at gaming cons without guests. That'd be uh, there'd be a grid table with sign up sheets on it. It was a it was a bit of a meta game, and people accepted it as part of the convention experience. You know, nah. that may be a previously accepted part of the experience, but um, it's usually expected in this day and age for a printed schedule to be available. Period. It's even, you know, even if it's just a sing a one sheet that people can grab, usually, you know, it's there's an expectation, you know, just because something was acceptable in like nineteen ninety two doesn't mean we should still be doing it. And just because some cons are still acting that way doesn't mean it's not bad. Yeah, I I it's for 30 bucks, you can print out 500 page copies of black and white pages at the UPS store of a grid of all of your events. Mm. So you need a thousand copies. That's 60 bucks, but it's, we're not talking like big money here. I would say this was, this thing. is a pretty small con. I think they only had like, they had less than 400 attendees. No brand con so. one, no brand con one back in the day when I was a young man. Our first program guide, we didn't have any money. I went with a ream of paper to a laser printer on campus and printed out all of the one-page program guide schedules of myself. <laughs> right after I handmade all the badges. You know, I think I still have my No Brand 2 badge. No Brand 2, I didn't make them. No, no. Brand 2, I mean, they were made the same way. <laughs> but... I made the no brand count one badges. God. I'm old. Yeah. I don't know. They 
there there were a lot of organization. I'll be interested to see how Kulikon evolves if I go back next year because I know the uh, the uh, person running it is not coordinating with the gaming club anymore, and they're going to be doing something on their own. So I don't know. I don't know what that's going to entail yet. I'll find out. Maybe. Fascinating. Yep. And that's really all we've got in the mailbag. Yep. Small mailbag this week, which means we are going to move on to our final section of the episode. And My that God. is, of course, the Vomit Head Steve Challenge. Now, the Vomit Hat Steve Challenge, for those who don't know, is that every episode I read a section of a book. And the challenge to you is to guess what book it is. It's exciting. It's wondiferous. It is splendid. If you guess the book correctly and send in the name of the book and the author to us, you get included in the Hall of Awesome. The benefits to the Hall of Awesome are as follows. One, you get your name listed on the website as part of the Hall of Awesome. Two, you get your name read aloud every regular episode of the podcast and while during the Bomb It Hat Steve Challenge segment. And three, nothing else, you greedy bastards. All right, these are the current people in the Hall of Awesome. Archimai Zero, Rena Innocenti, Cheesy McDamu, Krista, Slithery D, Shameless Otaku, The Random Ramblings Man, Corfang, Capito, Chris Graham, Lily Soros, Paper Godzilla, and Cavzy. Now, for That's the, a lot of people. That is. For the last several episodes, I've been reading from the same book. And again, with this episode, I'm going to continue to read from this book. Your sentence from the hall for, for the Vomit at Steve Challenge is as follows. Mozart was only six when Maria Teresa of Austria summoned him to the court at Vienna. If you know what book that's from, and again, I've been reading sentences from this book over the last, like, half dozen episodes at this point, go to nerdandtie.com, click on the content, contact form, and tell us. Or, if you want to write to us about anything else and be featured in our mailbag section, go to that same form, again, nerdandtie.com slash contact, or go to nerdandtie.com and click on the contact link, and uh, was, tell us anything you want. Wasn't that the line you read last week, Trey? Oh, that was? Yeah, I think it was. I read a different... I thought I... Okay. I could have sworn we it read that line It digitized out before. on me, so I couldn't, heard, I couldn't hear what it was. I guarantee we've read that line before. We should give them another line. All right. I'll give them another line. This is the <laughs> Vomit Head Steve Challenge. Another line. The great Empress of Russia, Catherine II, was born in Stettin on... 2nd of May, 1729. Again, if you know what book that is, go to nerdandtie.com slash contact and tell us. again. Or, if you have anything else you'd like to write to us about, go to nerdandtie.com slash contact and tell us uh, what size your pants are, whether or not you like Fur's hat, which conventions you'd like to see us at, and how much you love the idea of the Nerd and Tie Expo. Yes, it's important. It's amazing. It is splendiferous, wondiferous, pendiferous, omnidiferous. It's all that and a bag of chips. And just frankly drowning, drowning in its own fluids. <laughs> wow. <laughs> all right. I think with that, we need to end the episode. Take us home, Trey. Well, I... Would like to thank you all for listening. I have been Trey Dorn and continue to be. I will always be firsters. And in a, a past that hasn't yet happened, I am Nigazumi. And remember, you can always subscribe to our show on through iTunes or Stitcher. Remember, there's Stitcher app available for both iOS and Android. Remember to rate and review us on these services so we can, you know, let everyone know how awesome you think we are. And, uh... Yeah, Nick, say your catchphrase. Keep on spocking in the free world. Dance party. <laughs>